I have a half an hour to tell you a comparatively long story. So it will be impressionistic, long strokes, very ill-defined. I don't care whether it was 1980 or 1981. That's immaterial for my purposes here. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to give you an impression about the institution uh, that you have joined um, so that you will be able to situate, be situated in a context for the work, the important work that you are about to undertake. Marist College has had three presidents in its history, which begins in 1946. Marist College is noted for the longevity of its presidency. Its first president served from 1946 to 1958, Brother Paul Ambrose. He is a member, he's a Marist brother, and he's alive still, and he lives on this campus. <clears throat> he was succeeded by Linus Foy, who took the reins in 1958 at the ripe old age of 28 years and completed his service in 1979 for a period of 21 years. He was followed by Dennis Murray, who came in 1979, and who is the current president and is now in his 20th year. Interestingly enough, during that period of time, there have been eight CFA, uh, CAFs, chief, chief academic, CAOs, chief academic officers, eight, who have served an average of 5.125 years. They say in academic institutions, either the presidents keep leaving or the CAFs do, or CAOs do. Well, and I don't know what that says to you. Maybe it says that the Chief academic officers have a lot of work to do, and the presidents don't. I don't know, but in any event, that's 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 what that's what has a, that is what is extant in our institution, and it is useful to trace the history of the college in terms of those three presidencies. I refer to Brother Paul Ambrose's era as the foundation years, to Linus Foy's era as the teenage years, and to Dennis Murray's time as the coming of age. As you will, as you will learn from my story, uh, during Brother Paul Ambrose's time, this institution was born. The te Think of teenagers. What, is, what, is, what are the teenage years like? They're very dynamic. They're very clumsy and awkward, and the product at the end is nothing like the product at the beginning. Think of any 11 or 12 year old child that you know or knew, and think of that person at the age of 21. Change is dramatic, isn't it? On the other hand, by the time they reach 21, just about everything is in place. You, you really know the person. You know what their talents are, what their view is, you know what you kind of can, can expect of them. And that was true of Maris College by the time Linus Boyd's, Boyd's presidency ended. In a sense, everything was in place, and it was ready to be developed, it was ready to grow, which it, which it subsequently did. So uh, my story then will, will have three parts to it. I'm not going to tell you about the Dennis Murray years. We're living in those years now. But I want to tell you where Marist College came from. Why was it founded? And then I'm going to tell you about the years of its birth, its birth years, and then its teenage years. <clears throat> Marist College was founded by the Marist Brothers. The Marist Brothers is an order of religious men in the Roman Catholic Church. It was founded in France <clears throat> in 1817 by a country priest named Marcelin Champagne, who this year was declared a saint in the Roman Church. Champagne was born in 1789. Those of you who are historians know that that is the period of the French Revolution. And uh, southern France, which is where uh, he was born, well, it, it was a time of considerable chaos and poverty. And Champagne one day, as a priest, 
was uh, called to the uh, bedside of a dying peasant boy, this boy who knew nothing about his religion. And Champagne, in the few hours that he had with the boy, tried to comfort him and teach him about the presence of God and the place where he was going. And, and at that point in his life, determined that he was going to do something about the ignorance of, of the peasantry in, in southern France. And so he founded the Marist Brothers, starting off with two teenage kids, about 15, 16 years of age. I told you I wasn't going to be exact about these things. Uh, they made their living fashioning nails, and he taught them. First of all, he had to teach them their subjects. And then he taught them how to be teachers, and he founded their first school. By the time Champagne died, their schools, uh, the school of the Marist Brothers, uh, were throughout all of France, including uh, the North and in Paris and so on and so forth. A very dynamic period. Um, some, and that was in 1840. Around uh, the late 1800s, an anti-clerical administration uh, took over in France. And the religious orders were, in a sense, persecuted. Uh, most religious had the option either of leaving their congregations and returning to lay life or leaving the country. And Marist brothers did, some Marist brothers did each. But those who remained with the Brotherhood, it turned out to be that this diaspora was really the occasion of the growth of the Marist brothers as a worldwide institution. Because at the end of the uh, 19th century, in the 1800s, the brothers went to what they used to call Oceania in those days. They went down to uh, New Guinea and Australia, uh, to North America, North and South America, other countries of Europe, to Africa eventually. At the present time, the Marist brothers are on all the continents uh, of the world and in some 40, 50, 60 countries, some number like that. There are about 60, uh, 6,000 of them today from a maximum of about 10,000 in the early 60s. Uh, they came to uh, North America through French Canada. That was an obvi obvious choice. And eventually moved into the United States in the northern, northeast in Maine and New England, where there were large French communities. And eventually uh, it became uh, the, the congregation divided into units called provinces. And so there was an original Canadian province, and then eventually a United States province evolved from that migration into the Northeast. And um, one day they were looking for a place to establish headquarters, and they found Poughkeepsie. How, how they found Poughkeepsie <laughs> from Maine and uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, I don't know. But <clears throat> around 1903, they came to Poughkeepsie, um, and they purchased this property. They purchased this property through the sister of one of the, um, uh, the members of the, the Marist Brothers administration because there was a strong anti-Catholic uh, presence in Poughkeepsie and there was a considerable fear that they would not be allowed to purchase the property. So she purchased it and then deeded it over to the brothers. And the original property is this one on this side of the, um, the Waterworks Road that goes out there. And then eventually they, so in a sense, the North Campus. And then eventually, they purchased the South Campus. And, and again, just to bring you into present history, from, from this center, we've been expanding North and West, uh, East. We can't expand West for obvious reasons. And the sewage the plant is to the South, so we can't go much more in that direction. The mission of the Marist Brothers is education primarily and almost exclusively in those days education. Uh, the brothers founded schools, elementary and high schools. And the, uh, the mission here in Poughkeepsie, is, in, aside from its being the governance of the brotherhood, uh, this was where uh, brothers were trained and prepared for a life of teaching. And so uh, on this property, uh, they founded first a normal school Maybe those of you who are youngsters don't remember that language, but a normal school uh, was an, an enterprise that was uh, designed to prepare teachers. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, uh, the, there was a two-year entity associated with Fordham University, 
So it was almost like an extension of Fordham University on this campus. The brothers attended classes here for two years, and then they completed their work uh, in New York City at Fordham. And then eventually, in 1946, Brother Paul Ambrose, a very dynamic guy, very far-seeing and irrepressible, when he made up his mind to do something, it got done. But what the saints had to pay for it. I, and I say that because whenever, uh, in the early days, whenever we needed something, we had to do a novena to St. Joseph. And during the novena, St. Joseph's statue was covered with a blanket. And it was clear from the novena that if he didn't come through with the money we needed, the blanket would be there in perpetuity. <laughs> but in any event, in, uh, in 1946, um, the uh, Marist College received its charter uh, as Marion College in those days. Um, Marion, the combination of the name Mary, uh, that would be obvious, and Anne, uh, who was St. Anne, who was the, uh, uh, the, the patroness of the United States province. And by 1950, uh, we had our permanent charter from the state of New York. And so by 1946, we were in business here. So let me tell you about those years, those foundation years. I thought I would tell you that story in this fashion. Every institution, in a sense, is defined by its mission. It has a mission to someone, it has the means for accomplishing that mission, and it has the people who carry it out. So I'm going to tell you about the two who, the students in those days, the Marist brothers were being trained for a profession, the profession of teaching. Generally speaking, in institutions like this, the two thrusts, the two major ways that the mission is carried out is through the curriculum and through the extracurricular life. And of course, it's carried out by the faculty and by the staff. Well, <clears throat> the students were all male and they were all Marist brothers. The first graduating class numbered four. And by the, by the end of this era, by the end of Brother Paul Ambrose's era, there were roughly 150 Marist brothers uh, doing their studies here. It was, uh, in spite of that kind of homogeneity, it was a, a very polyglot place because Marist brothers from all around the world, small groups of them, were sent here uh, for their education, primarily because it was seen uh, the importance of, of studies in English was, was recognized in the, in the Marist Brotherhood. And so they sent some of their brightest here to get their undergraduate degrees, but to get them in, 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 not in English, but in an English setting. So we had biology students, but they were learning in English. And so uh, during my time as a student brother here, we had brothers from, from Canada, from Spain, Mexico, Brazil, Hong Kong, China, and France. And, uh, and in fact, um, I, I was a Spanish major at the time, and I made a trade-off with the brothers from Spain. I would, uh, I would do conversation courses with them on the side. I mean, this was informal. I would do conversation courses with them on the side in English, but they would have to do an equivalent amount of time with me in Spanish. Uh, the curriculum. Well, the curriculum uh, consisted of about 160 credits, two credit courses, 80 courses. <laughs> you did your work in three years and three summers. So we had a freshman year, sophomore year, and then you became a senior. Uh, the core curriculum was very heavy very and heavily larded in uh, courses in religion and in philosophy. We had a philosophy course every semester and of course in religion every semester. And um, on the average, there were two majors a year. Well, there were only 100 students here. You can't imagine that they had the whole panoply of majors. You would have like 0.5 students in each major. Now, the way it worked was that at the beginning of your sophomore year, oh, I can still remember that day, because your, your, your life was going to be decided. At least that's the way you felt. Because on that day, you would learn what the majors were. <laughs> so the sophomores gathered in a room, and Brother Paul Ambrose came in. Of course, he, he was awful, because he enjoyed this. Uh, and he knew that.
the tension that was in the room. He had pre uh, previously consulted with the director of education in the province to find out in the future what, what teaching areas are we going to need. And then he sat there and he said he would tell you, this year, for you, the majors are. Then there would be a long pause and he found out what they were. And then uh, you had three options. There were two majors announced, but there were three options. You could choose major number one, major number two, or you could leave <laughs> the college. And leaving the college meant that you went to New York City, you taught in an elementary school, and you did your baccalaureate, the rest of your baccalaureate education part-time, usually at Fordham University or St. John's. <clears throat> well, some of the majors were you know, reasonable, like uh, English and mathematics. One year, the choice was either chemistry or math. Well, the, the diaspora that year was enormous. Now, interestingly enough, the faculty, in a sense, it was the, the arrangements of the faculty mirrored those curricular needs because the permanent faculty on campus was simply the core faculty. We didn't have on campus a major staffing for the major fields because the major fields changed every year. And so every year, the faculty teaching the major level courses varied. And so the uh, director of the uh, province, the provincial, would send to Marist College brothers who were to teach, let's say, biology and French. And then the next year, they would be changed. Um, the, um, the, other, the other aspect uh, of, the, uh, of the methodology, of course, was student life. Well, it was a monastery. There was a very heavy emphasis on asceticism studies, but there was also a fully developed sports program. One of the senior students was designated as the sports commissioner. And as a guy who met, he knows, uh, one of his retired faculty members, Gus Nolan, two years my senior, was the sports commissioner when I was a freshman. And we had sports throughout the entire year. Uh, under this building was a swimming pool of uh, capacity 500,000 gallons, which we skated on in the winter and swam on in the summer. And of course, we, we couldn't afford to fill it by purchasing water from the city. So at the end of the winter, when the frost had, when, when everything had melted, it was pumped out. And then we waited for Mother Nature to fill it. Unfortunately, Mother Nature had put a, a spring down below here, and so it would gradually fill up and, and we, we, we would be ready for swimming in the summertime. The fact that that spring is there is well known to anybody who lives in this building because <laughs> great efforts were made in the early part of the year, of the, of the beginning of this building, to deal with the spring downstairs. Um, we had uh, all sorts of cultural uh, activities here. We had a band, we had an orchestra, we had a chorus, we had a glee club, we put on plays, which was something of a challenge with only males. Uh, and um, we, we had a, we had a, the only thing, uh, the only thing that was a little bit of a problem was that <clears throat> as far as music is concerned, <clears throat> we were not permitted to listen to um, radio programs where there was music with words. Some of those are love songs, you see. Ah, we were self-sustaining. Uh, we had, we were, we students were the maintenance department, the lawn keepers. Uh, we had uh, where Lowell Thomas stands, rough, I mean, uh, not Lowell Thomas, but Dyson stands. We had, well, between there and those residences, there were barns, pigsties, chicken coop over there. We had our own eggs and stuff like that. Um, 
We had cows, we had our own milk. In the spring, when the cows got into the new grass, you know that new onion grass that comes up in the early part of the spring? Well, the milk tasted like onions for about two weeks. We did all the maintenance. Uh, we had plumbers, we had electricians. We, we did the dishes, we peeled the potatoes, we cleaned the johns, everything. We were a self-sustaining uh, group. Uh, when I was a senior, uh, one of my, uh, my job was the laundry. And um, in those days, I could do 40 shirts in an hour, something that I did not reveal to my wife <laughs> when we got married. I, I sometimes used to tell her I would help her with the handkerchiefs if she needed them. Uh, and we did our own construction. Uh, the chapel was built by the brothers. Donnelly Hall was built by the brothers. Uh, the brothers got out of the construction business once we began to go into um, multi-story buildings. And the director of all of that was Nihilus, Nihilus Donnelly, who was self-taught. In 1958, Brother Paul Ambrose decided that the mission of the college needed to change, that, that a college of such small size could never really achieve uh, the goals of excellence in education. And so it was decided to open the college to the larger community. And that, of course, happened in stages. <clears throat> With that, Brother Paul Ambrose became um, one of the senior officials of the whole congregation, and he moved to Rome. And Brother Linus Foy, at the age of 28, was brought on board. Remember I told you about 12-year-olds and 21-year-olds and the differences? I'm going to tell you about those differences now in terms of those major categories. <clears throat> they always tell me that I have a half an hour. Of course, they never start me off at the right time. So even though it seems I'm late, I'm not. beginning of that era, 150 roughly Marist brothers. By the end of that era, now this we're talking about 21 years, that's not a very long time in the institution life. By the end of that year, <clears throat> men and women, no Marist brothers, and students in residence. <clears throat> How did it go? Well, at first, uh, we simply admitted local students. And there were no residences for them. And they more or less followed the monastic life of the brothers. I mean, the brothers, after their meal, midday meal, would recite the rosary walking around the campus. And the lay students did the same thing. Then the first dormitories were open. Uh, in the beginning, Donnelly Hall, Donnelly Hall, you know, the big round building, was uh, completed in 1960. And it, it was like everything was there, including, you know, where, well, you know it eventually, <clears throat> uh, downstairs uh, where the, there are classrooms uh, across from uh, the physics lab. That was those were dormitory rooms, and upstairs they were dormitory rooms, roughly where the business office is, uh, and financial aid. Well, the building was open in 1960, but it wasn't exactly ready. Uh, the dormitory rooms, which housed four students, um, one of them was completed, including it had windows. But the other nine, for the other 36 students, th there were no external panels still open to the weather. So when the students came ab aboard uh, on September 3rd, let's say, and with their parents, you know, they were kind of shown the first room and mar kind of marched through it, and the impression was created that that was their room. And then they went somewhere else and stowed their baggage. Well, when night fell, they found out where their rooms were. And in the case of 36 out of the 40, they were kind of living under the stars. I mean, it, it, it was a room, but it had no exterior wall. Well, of course, in September, that wasn't a big problem. But <laughs> imagine 
try to get away with that today. Uh, but in any event, uh, within a short time, everything was completed and so on. All right. Then comes the era of the building of the regular dormitories. Sheehan Dormitory goes up around 63. It's a three-story. Uh, Leo Hall is a six-story. goes up in 65. And then Chopinia, which is a nine-story, housing about 450, goes up in 68, I think, something like that. So in that short period of time, our capacity for resident students goes from zero to 120 plus 300 plus 450. Imagine the, dra the dramatics of that change and all the other growing pains that accompanied it, including recruiting faculty, the rate at which we had to recruit faculty in those years. Because at that, by that point, the uh, Marist brothers knew that they could not staff the college with brothers. And so, of course, we had the beginning of the uh, recruitment of regular lay persons. By the middle of the 60s, it was decided to accept women. Women were first allowed only in the evening school as part-time students. Then a few years later, they were allowed, they were admitted as full-time students, but not in residence. And then finally, uh, I'd say by 1970, they were admitted first-class citizens, uh, but they were the pioneers. These women came on campus in an all-male environment, and they had to teach us uh, to how you accommodate the distaff side of the house. One instance, the cafeteria was, the cafeteria food was oriented towards male students. And at some point, one of the women, one of the more outspoken leadership type women, approached the dean and said, um, do you think we could have some more salads? I mean, that was the kind of thing. <clears throat> the curriculum. First of all, the curriculum was pared down to 120 credits, which is what is required by the state of New York. Can you imagine the cost of having to field a degree for 160 credits? Uh, courses were changed to three credit courses. And then, you know, it's, I guess, historically, if you look at institutions, there's this kind of pendulum. You move from one thing to another. So here we are with this very heavy core curriculum and so on and so forth. And we made a dramatic swing in the 70s to probably the most liberal type of curriculum you could imagine. It was called the 60-60 curriculum. The 60-60 curriculum simply meant that your major field could, would specify 60 credits that were acquired of you. That included the major field courses and all cognate courses that they thought you should have, including if they thought you should have a course in biology, there was a course in biology. The other 60 credits were ad libitum. The theory was that with proper guidance and so on and so forth, students with the health faculty members would construct a liberal arts education for themselves that would, was tailored to their needs. Naivety. Aren't, aren't teenagers sometimes naive about things about life? So, <clears throat> interestingly enough, after, after this curriculum was in place for maybe about 10, 12 years, Linus Foy, who by the way, introduced computers to the campus, uh, did a computer analysis of what choices students have been making, have been making for the past 12 years. Well, it turned out students were not adventurous. They were not trying out anything new. They were staying as close to comfortable places as, as they could. And so in short order, that curriculum was rejected. And the curriculum that we have today, pretty much the shape of the curriculum we have today, was adopted in around 1977-78. Student life. It went from in loco parentis to all hell breaks loose, in a sense. Again, we, I mean, in loco parentis was in loco parentis. I mean, and I was in the dormitory at the time. Those students had to be in their rooms at 8 o'clock. 
o'clock in the evening at their desks with their doors open. No, no music, no radios or anything like that. Study. At 10 o'clock, there was a break during which they, can, they could take their showers, <clears throat> get ready for bed. 10.30, all upper lights out. Only permitted lights were desk lamps. They were permitted to close their doors, and then they, they could study at their desks, or they, could, or they could retire. Not a sound was to be heard. On weekends, they had to be in by midnight. The seniors could be in by 2 o'clock. And there's no check. And if they step out of line, they were canvassed. Can you imagine what happened to that during the uh, Vietnam years? I told you dramatic change. Athletic programs. When we started off at that time, I don't know, you don't know the buildings very well, but if, ha, take a look at Marion Hall someday. Marion Hall is roughly between Donnelly and the Champagne complex. That was the gym. By the end of that era, the McCann uh, complex had been built. Just to give you a, a sense of those changes. The faculty. The faculty, by the end of the Paul Ambrose era, was run roughly like a, mon a monastery. In other words, the teachers were all brothers, and they had a religious superior. And decisions were made by the religious superior about curricular things as well. Well, when Linus Poirier took over, he quickly recognized that this was not going to work if we were going to become an institution in the mainstream. And it was he who insisted that the faculty develop its own independent governance. Uh, the governance that we have today was begun, I was on the first committee, uh, the committee of committees that established the, at least the skeleton, uh, and that was in 1962-63. The governance of the college, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, the Maris brothers decided that the college would be better off separate from the order, that the order simply did not have the resources and it did not have the range of talent that would be necessary. It did not have the financial acumen uh, that would be necessary for this college to achieve greatness. And so in Linus Boy's era, the governing board, which consisted of all Maris brothers, was gradually expanded. And laymen were added to that board. And at some point, there were more laymen were Maris Brothers, <clears throat> and at that point, the Maris Brothers ceased to control this company. <clears throat> that gift, this whole campus, the Maris Brothers gave this whole campus over to an independent entity. It is our major and most important. I'm going to stop now, <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to conclude uh, with these words. The founder of the Marist Brothers, St. Marcelin Champagne, in his, his, in his spirituality, which I'm not going to go into in great detail, but there are two elements that I think are pertinent. Uh, one was that uh, his insistence that any institution that the Marist Brothers founded and ran, should be characterized by a family community spirit. And secondly, that in all, of the, in all of the missions that they undertook, there should be a concern for those who were less fortunate, those on the margins of society. And I believe that Marist College has been faithful to that tradition. I hope that if we were 
experience here, you find that to be the case. Let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> we had, we have the second longest standing upward bound program in the United States. The only institution that has one that's older than ours is Columbia University. And I think you know that the upward bound program is designed to help uh, marginal students in, during their high school years to get up to speed so that they can go to college. During the days when the state of New York was enlightened, in contrast to its current depravity, there were educational programs in the prisons so that prisoners would have the opportunity to reform their lives and become useful citizens. Harris College had programs in many uh, local uh, prisons that were seen as exemplary. And the people who taught in them were doing it from their hearts. Someday, I would hope you meet uh, Professor Edward Dunphy, and you talk to him about those programs. We, had, uh, we have a program here, Science on the Move. <coughs> uh, it's for local high school teachers. <coughs> they have their regular <coughs> programs here during the summer. At the end of the program, there was a very strong um, sense expressed to members of the staff here that, <clears throat> that these teachers found Maris College to be the most unusual place. A place where there was always a helping hand, where people were friendly. People say our students are friendly. Visitors to the college say there is a, it's a friendly place. You're invited to become part of this and to make your contribution to it. I'm completing my 39th year this year, and I've lived through every all these this part, all these stories that I've told you. And uh, <clears throat> I had the unparalleled opportunity in, as a youth to make all kinds of mistakes because we did during all, all the years. We still. very exciting. And I, I'll reiterate what our team said to you. It's still small enough for you to have an opportunity to make a difference. And our continued greatness depends on your taking up the reins. You know, old geezers like, my, like myself are not going to be here for very much longer. And we need our sons and daughters. We need our replacements. We need you to carry on. And you're going to have a great time.